that right B rose we the church I was like we are the church he's like take out the R so anyways we the church we're starting today and um, a brand new series so you came on a great day so let's pray and then he'll come out so God thank you so much just for who you are Jesus, we thank you that we get to step into the yes, that we get to just surrender it all. So God, I pray that um, you just continue to speak to us, God, that you continue to dwell in this place. And we thank you for every single person that showed up here today. And we just pray that you have your way in your name. Amen. 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 Well, what a day it's been so far. Um, There's a lot of change happening here, which is great. Um, I missed the opening song in the beginning because if you didn't know, Legends has a new basketball hoop down there. So I was hooping with the little kids and I heard the, I heard the opening song. I was like, oh man, I got to get to church so you can ask your kids if I was like trying to cross them over and stuff. Because I was. It, they were in first grade. But I was so excited about our basketball hoop. And um, man, that last song all uh, just really hit me. And when Hannah sang that, ah, you remember that? You know what I'm talking about? Oh my goodness, I was like, it never gets old. We've been uh, doing ministry with Hannah and her husband, Wes, who was on the drums for like 13 years now. And when she hit that, I was like, oh man, I'm so thankful she's in our house, amen. It's just so cool to see. Thank you, Fallon, you can give it up for them. It's so cool to see just the collective different gifts coming into one place. And I could not be more expectant of the season we're stepping into as a church. If you've been here for the last few months, we have been planning We've been preparing, we've been praying for the season we're walking into, and we really feel that the Holy Spirit is, um, it's, we're just getting started with what he's doing in our church, and so for whatever he's up to, whatever he's doing, we're saying yes, we're all in, amen. And the crazy thing about when you're a part of a church like ours is every single time you step into a place, there's a certain culture. You don't even probably even realize it. Every place you step into, every store you step into, every soccer field that you walk on into, your home has a culture. You don't know it because you're used to it, but maybe somebody else walks into your home and they're like, ooh, they take shots at each other all the time, or oh man, they're, they're really quiet, or man, they have a lot of fun. You don't realize it because it's the culture you've created, but every time someone steps into the culture, they are reminded, oh, there's certain house rules. And even in the kingdom of heaven, there are certain house rules where the Lord says, these things are really important for me. For the body of Christ to move and operate in this way. And we forget that the church is a living organism. We forget that it was never supposed to stay us for and no more. But as we walk through the last few months through the letter of Acts, and we've seen this movement happening, we are the ones that are usually the ones that resist change, right? Because a lot of times we always look back at how things used to be as the better days. Think about even our bodies are changing and you don't even realize that your body is changing all the time. And so you look back at maybe an old picture or some of you like an old yearbook photo, right? And you're like, what was I doing with my hair, you know? Or why did I think those clothes were so cool? Or a lot of times you look at the group of friends that you had maybe in middle middle school or high school and years later you're like, why did I think this group of friends was so cool? You know what I'm talking about? So my uh, wife and I, we, ha- we have six kids if you're new here, and so a lot of our, the, the birthdays end up in the summertime, and so we have pictures that we put around the house, and so I came across this one picture of me when I was three. Look at this picture right here when I was three years old. Look at that. That's like an olive-skinned Italian immigrant right there, right off the boat. My grandma came off the boat from Sicily, and my mom thought to herself, what can I do to make my three-year-old look like he's fresh in America? And there it is right there. <laughs> But you know what's crazy about that? All these years later, nobody in my life says, aww, anymore. You know what they say? Man, you're getting old. (laughs) Or you look so tired. And I'm like, and you're not? Can we be real? Like, I have to be pastoral, and I'm doing a lot better on the things I say, so I filter through things. Now, my looks, I'm still working on. Anybody relate to that? I'm still working on that. But I think to myself, like, you see yourself every day, and you're telling me I'm looking old. We're all getting older. Things are changing. The only time that's cool to say to someone is, like, young people, right? Because kids and teenagers love to hear that, right? You're going back to school. Every teenager likes to hear, wow, you grew so tall. 
You used to have a squeaky voice last year, but now you sound like a man, right? You're filling out. You're looking beautiful. Why? That's young people. You don't say that to people who are older because we usually relate change to something negative, don't we? Every single time something is changing, we think through negative lenses, and yet there's something so exciting happening in the body of Christ, but a lot of times we miss it because we're always looking behind us. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a few weeks, and we're going to talk about some anchors that make us us. For some of you who have been with us for a long time, this is going to be a reminder. Oh, this is who we are. This is the way we treat people. This is the way we'll never treat people. This is the way that we respond in conflicts. If you're new, this is going to be a great time to lock in with us and say no matter how much we grow, no matter how many things change and the structures change and the building might change, these are the anchors that will always make us us. And so if you have your Bibles, and I trust you do by now, your journals, your notebooks, get those out. Open up to Luke chapter 7. Luke is in the New Testament. If you're new to the Bible, you can open up in the middle and hang a right, and you'll land in Matthew, Mark, and you'll land in the letter of Luke. And we are going to talk about one of the, the anchors, the key values that is so close to Jesus' heart. And we are going to be talking about we are the church, how we view being part of this community. There's a lot of different communities that you could step into and cultures that make them them, but we're going to talk about today what makes us us in terms of being a part of this spiritual family. Being in community in 2024 looks drastically different so often the way that Jesus taught us to walk in community with one another. It looks vastly different than even the New Testament letters and, and acts, the way that you see brothers and sisters in Christ loving one another and exciting and excited to be together. And there's this expectation and this anticipation being in the house of the Lord. And the, re and the reason that is, and it's such a struggle for so many people, is because we have been groomed in America to think as solo artists. Chances are you have been taught to read the Bible not just through individual lenses, but to view all the promises of God through American lenses. And so then you're discouraged if you don't see some of the things in the Bible happening in your own life. And so it is very rare to find a group of people that is fully devoted to one another, especially with the noncommittals and the church hoppers, which is a category now on the rise in our generation, you don't have people that just are planted and rooted in places anymore. John 17, Jesus said it like this, John 17, 20, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them, not some of them, not just the spiritual elite, not just those who are considered themselves to be theologians, but all of them may be one, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, here it is, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. This gathering that we're in, this gathering that is growing weekly in our church, the, the purpose of our connect groups and our serve days is like a billboard of hope to our world of what we value. And we want our community to know that one of our core values is Jesus is central. We don't just say that for our website. We say Jesus is central in every single aspect of our church. From our serve days to I Love My City to Vive Care to our legends down to our nursery to the way that we sing our songs, our discipleship platforms, Jesus is central in everything that we do. And in full transparency today, there are some messages that come a lot easier to me. It's not easy writing messages every week, trying to get a pulse on what the Lord is doing, but some weeks it's a little bit easier. But for some reason, I thought this one was going to be easy because this is what we do. This is what we love. And so um, the beginning of the week, I started going down a couple different directions. I really felt good about it. I just kept fe feeling this no. This, it wasn't that it was wrong. It was just no, not for this weekend. And so um, I just decided just to grab some coffee, just put on that song, All That We Just Sang. And man, the Lord just started ministering to me as it was on repeat over and over again. And I just text Tam, who's over our uh, music, and I just said, hey, I just really feel, is it too late to just add this song in the song set? And she texts back right away. She's like, no, I, we got you, no problem. And I'm just 
so thankful for a music team that is just open and flexible to where the spirit is leading amen i'm just so thankful that we don't have to just be so rigid we tried to plan but there are moments it doesn't happen often but there are moments where we're like man i just feel a different direction as the lord was moving on my heart this word kept coming back to me over and over again and it's this word lonely this word lonely that you could be surrounded by people i'm not talking about the world today we're talking about the family of god you could be surrounded by so many people in the family of god and did you know you could still feel lonely singles you need to hear this you could be in a marriage and still feel lonely you could be in the presence of god like today and still feel loneliness in some area of your life in fact there was a survey done in 2020 saying 61 percent of young people between the ages of 18 and 25 experience severe degrees of loneliness in their life 30 percent 36 percent of people feel loneliness frequently almost all the time the survey concluded one out of three people in america don't just feel lonely some of the time but most of the time that just broke my heart in america in a country that claims to be a christian nation the majority of our nation still feels loneliness in a day and age where we have more ways to be connected than ever before through social media and so many different platforms in a day and age where we have some of the most dynamic communicators at our fingertips to watch anytime we want in a, in a day and age where there's full of options, literally, there's a church almost on every corner in America, and yet still, one out of three people feel extreme loneliness. And the stats for our teams are almost worse. <clears throat> After four years later, those stats are only growing. And we have carried all those pains from the past several years with us, into every community we step into and every community we find belonging in. And we tell ourselves the lie, I don't need to put my burdens on anybody else, don't we say that? Or we say, you don't need to worry about me. And that's just lies we tell ourselves just to keep us in a cycle of loneliness. Not realizing you and I were never meant to do life alone or process life alone. The Bible says in Genesis, which is the very first letter in the Bible, that is not good for man to be alone. That is not a marriage Bible verse. That is the way that he designed us to live in community. Pastor and author Dr. Glenn Packiam said this, you can't enjoy the fruit of community without the root of commitment. Let me say that again. You can't enjoy the fruit of community without the root of commitment. I know for myself in my hardest or my best weeks ever, there's no place I'd rather find myself than in the presence of God on Sundays, amen? There's no other place I'd rather be than with God's people throughout the week because I know I can't do this life alone. And in a generation full of options, the Bible narrows the focus down to being rooted and planted in one house because God knows in this life you're gonna have many troubles. He knows there's gonna be a lot of addictions that we struggle with. He's gonna, he knows there's gonna be a lot of false doctrine, false prophecy, false belief systems that people are gonna try to pull you into different directions. So you gotta get rooted in a spiritual family that knows what they believe. I love it where the Hebrew, the letter of Hebrews, the Apostle Paul talks about don't neglect the gathering. But it's hard to live missionally and show up and spur each other's on like Hebrew talks about. It's hard to be faithful to connect to connect groups that we sign up for. It's hard to be happy for other people when you're not rooted in a spiritual family. Because then you just get so consumed with me, myself, and I, and you forget there are so many people going through so many things, but we're supposed to do life together. And so I found myself in the letter of Luke, chapter 7, and we're going to unpack this together, and I hope it speaks to you in our church. And I want you to see how we view community together. It says this in Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 36. It says, Then one of the Pharisees invited him, speaking of Jesus, this Pharisee invited Jesus to eat with him. He entered the Pharisee's house, and Jesus reclined at his table. And a woman in the town who was a sinner, if you have a physical Bible, I would just love for you to circle or highlight that, was a sinner, found out that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. 
She brought an alabaster jar of perfume and stood behind him at his feet, weeping. Can you imagine the loneliness and heartache she must be dealing with to push her to a place to be in a house that she never thought she would ever find herself in? Can you imagine how lonely you would have to be to force yourself into a room you were never invited into? She never thought in a million years she would be in this Pharisee's house. And this time, the word they used for this woman when they said, who was a sinner, was a title they gave to the town prostitutes during that time. That was the title that she had to live with. This was someone who was deeply lonely, who, who felt used by people, probably many spiritual leaders that were doing their things on Sunday, but yet also abusing her in private. And yet she would see these same people walking to a church on a Sunday, so to speak, not exactly like this, but yet that she couldn't find community, but they could. Every day people are talking about her. Every day people are disgusted with her. And she was not allowed, and not only into anyone's life, she was not allowed around anyone's table. And I don't want us to miss this as we unpack it today, but Jesus was already lounging at the table with sinners before she even walked in. These religious Pharisees were not followers of Jesus, and yet isn't it interesting, church, how we could spot the sin in others, but we are blind to our own sin. How we can label others that they are sinners, yet we act like we are the religious elites. We demand grace from people, but it's so hard to see with eyes of grace for other people. One sin was private, covered up by religious activity, And the other sin was public for everybody to see, and both needed a Savior. Amen? The problem was Simon, this Pharisee, did not think that he needed to be saved. And let's not even forget Judas, a staff member, so to speak, was also there. I'm so thankful Jesus took the VIP rope down, and all are welcome at the feet of Jesus. Amen? This home had the craziest people around this table. And this woman, whether it was because of the messages she heard, whether because she was around the ministry, she was close to seeing. There's so many different commentaries on on who this woman was and her role. We can't get into that today. But the point is, something moved her to say, enough, I can't hold it back anymore. I can't keep it to myself anymore. I can't keep staying in the same cycle, hurting myself and those closest to me anymore. I can't keep holding my worship to myself anymore. I can't keep holding my testimony and my praise to myself anymore. And the disciples were watching this because this would be a blueprint for Acts 2 and the letter of Acts that they would have to follow. I mean, just think of Matthew and Peter in the same room. Those two alone would be enough to derail a connect group conversation, wouldn't they? That alone, we've all been in connect groups where two people go off on this crazy tangent and everybody else gets awkward, right? That's why we do a lot of training. We say, hey, these are the conversations you're allowed to talk about, and these are the things that are off limits, because we know everybody brings in their backstory and the things that they value. Matthew was once called Levi, and he was a former tax collector, but Simon, who was renamed Peter, was a tax protester. In our day and age, it would be like someone on the left is in a connect group with someone who is passionate about things on the right. Enter the family of God. Matthew worked for the Romans. Peter was a rebel of them. Matthew was very wealthy. Peter was not very wealthy. Can you imagine the debates around the fire that they got into about political things? Can you imagine the things that Jesus had to keep bringing things back to through kingdom lenses? That's why we spend a lot of time training our connect group leaders, the do's and the don'ts, the things you have authority to talk about, the things that you don't have authority to talk about. Why? Because we know in our connect group setting, in a setting like Sunday morning, there are so many people coming together at different places in their life that are struggling with different things, that value different things, and we want every single person to feel loved and seen and cared for so no one feels lonely or alone. That doesn't mean we don't address things, and if you've been a part of our church, we have core, we have theological training, we have discipleship groups, we have standards, but there are some platforms that you have to bring things back to the main thing because we're so easily get caught up in our thing that we miss the main thing. There's not one church that you're a part of 
or that you will be a part of that does not require you working through things with other people. Every single family has different things that they're working through. Every single family has different personalities in the home. This is God's design, not for you specifically, but for us collectively to grow us and unite us and help us become all that we were meant to be in Christ. And yet so often we're resistant to it because we're only looking for people who look like us, believe like us, and vote like us. And all of these people in this room, including the disciples, needed something different from Jesus. Society lives with a worldly mindset. And let me be honest with you, many churches in America have adopted this mindset and embraced this. When it comes to someone's lifestyle or sin, we have been taught there's only two options. Affirmation, and taught you either affirm them fully or you reject them permanently. But that's not the way that Jesus taught. The way that Jesus taught us is a third option in community. Speak the truth absolutely with grace and love. Amen? That means you have to know what the truth is, but you have to leave room for relationships and conversations where you don't see them as a project to fix, but people to love. We will love you, but we will never bend to our convictions or downplay sin either. But that doesn't mean that we can't create spaces for every person to feel loved and have a place of belonging in the family of God. Just as long as you can honor the house that you're in, honor the spiritual leadership that you're in. Is that way more messy? Is it way more complicated? Absolutely, it is messy. It is very complicated, but I believe it's the way of Jesus. To be a community full of all types of people and all of us working to move from glory to glory. This woman was trying to change things in her life, but they were always linking her to her past. Many of you know people like that. She's trying to change her life, but they just always view her as the sinner in the neighborhood. Many of us know that feeling. We're embarrassed that that relationship didn't work out. We're ashamed, maybe, of how we handled a situation. We're ashamed that we knew the Bible stories. We knew it was wrong, but maybe we just made a poor decision and opened ourselves up to certain things that detoured us from the plans of God for a moment, and you may feel shame and embarrassment, but you're trying to get your life together. You're trying to make changes, but every time you walk into that connect group or that church, someone else tries to link you to your past. Oh, they used to be with that person. They used to roll with those types of people. And I'm so thankful Jesus never gets tired of our voice, amen? Because a lot of us, we're just tired of other people having pity on us. We're tired of always being sad. We're tired of always being broken. We're tired of always being in one of the connect group who needs something. Well, let me tell you, every single person who walks into a connect group or a church needs something. We're just in different places in our life. Being in a Jesus community in a connect group does not mean, listen, church, that we all have to experience the same things to connect with one another. Simon the Pharisee had all the theology. He can run circles around you when it comes to Bible stories, but he had none of the emotion and he had none of the compassion. That is such a picture of so many people in America. You could tell all the Bible stories and you know the Greek and the Hebrew, but nothing moves your heart for people. You just have this pride and this arrogance and God is trying to get your attention but you don't think you're the one that needs to be saved. You think somebody else does and you don't think you're in need of a savior. Our love for God, church, please memorize this, is shown in our love and compassion for other people. Our love for God is shown in the way that we love and have compassion for other people. I love so many pictures of Jesus crying, so many pictures, pictures of Jesus having compassion and empathy with all different kinds of people. You see, when we're full of Jesus, there's not a lot of room to be full of ourselves. When you're full of Jesus, there's not, you have to have this spirit that wants to carry each other's burdens. We don't have to have a shared experience for me to have empathy and compassion for you as an image bearer of Christ. We don't have to have a shared experience for me to have compassion for what you're walking through. Jesus allows himself, listen to this, to be interrupted and inconvenienced. That's what so many of our connect group hosts, our connect group leaders, they have made room in their already full calendar. You're not the only one that's busy, amen? You're not the only one that has things going on. You're not the only one that has to rush kids to games and practices and all that stuff. But our church has created room and space for us to be inconvenienced and interrupted 
so we could be the hands and feet of Jesus. Being in a multi-ethnic, intergenerational family like Vive is an incredible gift. Our diversity is our strength, and we learn from each other's differences, but can we keep it real today? A lot of times we are bringing our pain and our past experiences into spaces you know people can't relate to. You're bringing your past experiences into a church like this. You're bringing your pains and the things you're walking through, and you walk in a door and you're like, you already size people up even if you don't mean to. That person will never be able to relate with what I'm going through because we, we see the outward exteriors. We begin to label different types of people. Don't let that keep you from signing up or showing up because there is beauty in the work of Jesus that all of us coming together who look different, believe different, vote differently, parent differently, and yet we're coming under the umbrella of Jesus. And I love what it says in verse 38 if you're following along, and then we'll jump to verse 44. It says this. So this woman who was standing behind Jesus, she was weeping. So she brought an alabaster jar of perfume, stood behind him at his feet weeping, and began to wash his feet with her tears, speaking of Jesus. She wiped his feet with her tears, kissing them and anointing them with the perfume. Turning to the woman, Jesus says to Simon, now pay attention to this. That's the religious Pharisee. Jesus said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, which was custom for guests. But Simon was too good and apparently didn't see Jesus as a guest. She, with her tears, washed my feet and wiped them away with her hair. You gave me no kiss, which again was custom for friendship. But apparently this Pharisee did not see Jesus as a friend. This was a culture thing in this Pharisee's house. And she hasn't stopped kissing my feet, which in the Middle East, that would have been always the dirtiest place on someone because of their sandals. She hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. Verse 46, you did not anoint my head with olive oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. Pause really quick. Do you know how humiliating this would have been to this Pharisee's ego? To Jesus looking at this Pharisee in his own home and rebuking him? Jesus is saying, you care way more about your reputation than actual real life change. You just, you just care about your outward appearance and what other people think of you on social media, what other people think of you in whatever religious circles. You're not really interested in changing. You just want to look like you have association with me, but you don't really want friendships. Am I preaching to someone this morning? You're in church, but you don't really want to change. You're just here for friends. You're in the presence of God, but you're not really trying to repent. You're just here for the experience. You're not really here for God. You don't see him as a friend. Maybe you see him as a spiritual slot machine. You see him as your spiritual Alexa. You're not really opening up the Bible and looking and say, God, whatever is in my heart that is offending you change, whether it's my sexuality, whether it's my mindset, where it's my money. No, you're looking for loopholes. You're looking and saying, okay, how can I fit my lifestyle in with yours? That's not the way Christianity works. And so when you get into a church like Vibe or around connect groups, it could get incredibly uncomfortable because we're always going back to the Word of God and say, hey, I love you, but man, if, until this gets corrected, we're never going to be walking down the same path together. And look what he says. He said, therefore, I tell you, her many sins has been forgiven. That's why I love this verse. That's why she loved much. But the one who is forgiven... Lo forgiven little loves little then he said to her your sins are forgiven now he's looking to her those who are at the table with them began to say among themselves this is the craziest connect group ever so began to say among themselves who is this man whoever forgives sins and he says to the woman your faith has saved you I love this go in peace or go in shalom this woman who let her hair down, which in those days would have been grounds for divorce. They had some crazy laws back then, but you only let your hair down as a woman in the privacy of your husband, which I just love the story. We can't get into today about the capital M marriage and the groom coming back for the bride. We can't get into that today, but it is such a beautiful picture of what Jesus was already doing. And she poured out everything publicly as an act of worship. 
And if you put all the Gospels together in chronological order, and someday we'll do this in our core um, teaching, if you put all the Gospels in chronological order, just before this dinner happened, Jesus preached this message publicly in a space like this. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest, or I will give you shalom. I will give you peace. Jesus is modeling in a small connect group what he preached publicly. To gather in a large community like this, but a lot of times the d deepest part of discipleships are happen happens around circles in homes where you hear it and now it's fleshed out in smaller groups. You see, if people aren't able to be in Jesus' environments like we have on Sundays, like we try to create in Connect Groups Church, let me tell you, they will pour out their life and their heart in communities and spaces that will create even more pain and confusion and eventual loneliness. Because we are designed to pour out our pains and our lives before somebody. But many times we look to other communities and other groups and other people or other things other than Jesus. Our job is to work as hard as we can to get the vision to set the table for people to experience community and connection with God and others. We are committed to that. We can't make you show up. We can't make you get excited for Vibe. We can't even, I know this is hard, we can't even force friendships or community on people. What our job is, is our job is to acquaint, equip the saints for ministry and to work as hard as we can, and to pour ourselves out every day, every single week, for our spiritual family, for the opportunity for you to get connected to the family of God. One of the things doing life in close proximity with different groups of people is it develops a heart of compassion for other experiences people are walking through. You, you don't even realize, and I'm not saying this as a slight to anybody because it's myself included. You don't even realize we think about ourselves all the time until you get around other different types of people. And you're like, oh, wow, there, there are other people, who, other people who just had a baby and they're still serving. Oh, wow, there's other people who are single and they're not just craving marriage, but they're content in singleness. Oh, wow, there's other empty nesters and they still have a vision and a pastor, pas passion for the house of the Lord. Right, because if you're only in your own world, in your own culture, and you're, you just think about me, myself, and I, but when you get out around other people, you're like, how are you carrying everything that you're carrying and still excited for the things of God? How are you able to still do the things that you do and still have a heart for ministry? One of the ways that that happens and grows in us is that you stay around different groups of people, which means singles, you still need married people in your life, Amen. Married people, you still need singles in your life. We still need to look after our young people and our teenagers and our kids. We need the different age groups in our lives. The disciples would have never thought in a million years they would have been in the same room with that woman. Enter church. The, the disciples would have never thought that they would ever, ever cross paths with other different people in different, um, in di different ethnicities. Enter Jesus. There's just something about Jesus and his kingdom that forces you into spaces, intergenerational, multi-ethnic spaces to begin to work out things in you that you can't work out on your own. If you're just always around people who believe like you, vote like you, parent like you, drive the same minivan as you, live in the same neighborhood as you, come on somebody, you're only gonna see through those lenses. And then anybody else who steps into that culture, they're weird. As opposed to say, maybe there's things that they're challenged, prejudices, biases, things that I've always believed because of the community that I thought was family, but now I get into a group like this, and I would have never thought I would have a pastor that looks like him. I never thought, wow, there's a few amens in there. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. I didn't take that personally. Good thing I don't get offended easily, but I get it. I would have never been in a church that looks like that. I would have never thought I could uh, connect to a worship experience that sounds like that because we've already told ourselves certain things. So by the time you even get into a space like this or a connect group like that, you've already have so many walls that you have to break down. It's hard for you to get connected. Man, it's hard for us to get connected because we've already told ourselves we don't need anyone. We've already told ourselves that we're good, just me, just my family, just my wife. We've told ourselves all the time that, oh, that's just the way girls are. This is just the way guys are. And then you step into different spaces. You're like, oh, wow, that's not how everybody is. That's not how every man, man treats people. That's not how every single is, single is in our generation. 
It's no secret that I love to cook outdoors. I, wasn't, I didn't grow up in a house like that. I've, I've learned to do it, and I'm just, I've learned as I've cooked outside more and more, I'm like an old school, like, wannabe pit master where I don't do all the injections and all the things that you see that so many people are doing nowadays. Like, my thing is high-quality meat, just simple seasonings and real smoke flavor. That's, a, that's what I personally love. Like, I just let the smoke and the smoker do the work, and I just try to stay out of the way, but a few, um, excuse me, a few uh, months ago, I was out of town, and I went to, I was going to someone's house, and they were talking about, um, they were going to have barbecue and brisket. They're like, hey, I want to invite you over. You're going to have the best brisket you've ever had. I was like, oh, cool. I, that, that'd be fun, right? But by now, I've already smoked hundreds of briskets, tasted thousands of them. I know what it's supposed to look like, taste like. I know, what, like, it's like I know, right? And so I walk in, and like, I looked right when I saw it. I was like, that's not what a brisket is supposed to look like, right? <laughs> Like, you get experience in life, you just know you could dump whatever you want on it. People who are experienced could tell the texture of the meat, and they're like, oh, it's dry, or it's overcooked. And so I tasted it, and they're like, what do you think? And I'm like, that, it's interesting. Like, I was like, what did you, I was like, what did you do to it? He's like, oh, I put pineapple juice all over it. I injected it with all those th- 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 these different things. I poured soup on it, and then I covered it up, and I was like... <laughs> Oh, so you're not serving brisket then, right? That's something totally different. Like, that, I didn't even need to, you didn't even need to tell me what you did for me to taste like, I don't know what you did, but something is different. It might look like brisket on the outside, but I know, I know what it's supposed to taste like. Now, now this comes from experience, this comes from knowing what it's supposed to look like. This is, what, this is from someone who spent hours, thousands of hours by a fire, knowing it, what it's supposed to look like, taste like, smell like. You know those things. That way, when you get into an environment, you don't need to tell me something's different. I can instantly sense something's different. Are you following me? And that's what the—there are so many Christians that are calling themselves Christians in this generation, and they're taking things away, and they're adding things to the gospel, and God's really not that—it's not that important. It's all good good and we're all the same and we're like it's not the same you're trying to act like it's the same but we're not following the same jesus are you are you with me friends we're like we're not following the same jesus because you don't need to take or add anything to the gospel to make it better we just need to get out of the way he says that you're going to be like salt in the world there's, there, but there's a fire process, there's a cooking process, there is a grooming process through the ways of the kingdom, but we don't want to get out of the way. We want everything instant. So we just inject it, and we pour things on, and, we just, and then people come around that are real followers of Jesus. They're like, you might believe that, and you might have convinced yourself that's the same, but we're not following the same gospel. There might be aspects that look the same, but I don't think that we have the same anchors and values that, we, that it looks like on the outside. There are so many people that are trying to claim Christianity, and it's not the same thing, because once you've tasted and seen what Jesus really is, what a real Jesus community really is, you don't want counterfeits anymore, amen? I don't want to pay for dry brisket anymore. Like, I don't want to pay, because I already know, like, I know what it's supposed to taste like. I know what it's supposed to smell like, and I, that, that's the only type. Anybody else getting hungry this morning? <laughs> that's the only type I want. Like, we don't have time to waste in communities that are not going to push us towards holiness. Come on, somebody. Like, young people, you just don't have time. Eternity is too long. Hell is too hot. God is too good. To start just worrying about, are they going to like me? Are they not going to like me? Are they going to leave our church? Are they going to lead our connect group? We got to have a higher standard. Like, you got to have some friends in your life that is going to hold you to the standard of the Word of God. Not lower our convictions because we just said it's too hard. Or I've, I, I feel like, like what, whether I feel like it or not, like that song says, my answer is yes. And if we're honest... Do we really bring our all to Jesus or just the places that are easy? Are we really saying, yes, have my all, like everything? My body, my mind, my finances, my gifts that are already your gifts anyways. You just gave them me to to, to minister to the church. Are, Are we really showing up for him? It's something that we have to ask ourselves. I saw so many people going wild on social media yesterday 
when Mahomes did this little behind the back thing for a three yard gain. Uh, amazing, right? I've seen that on the playground a thousand times growing up, but never in an NFL game, but seen it a thousand times. And yet the world's going crazy for a three yard gain in a preseason game that doesn't matter. And we don't get excited that Jesus got up from the grave, church. Like, I don't, I don't think you really understand that he got up. Like, he's not there anymore. Like, that's not an Easter thing. If you're numb to that, we just ask yourself, then who are you really following? Because the things that get us excited, our worship, our serving, our generosity, is because he's not in the grave anymore. Because our king is alive, and so whatever he says now is yes and amen. And I'm not trying to downplay the things that we see in the Olympics, the sports. It's amazing. We wow at it. I'm looking at these Olympians, and I'm looking at the stuff that they're doing in the NFL. It's amazing. But they don't know me. I don't know them. So it's, a, it's like three hours of me cheering. It was fun. But it's, it doesn't deserve my all or my worship or the primary of all my affections. That's only reserved for Jesus. It's in the breaking church that we begin to treasure the preciousness of Christ for Christ alone. It's in the breaking. It's in the discipling. It's in being told no. It's in the, the command say, do not. Not just the blessings, but do not walk in this way. It's in those moments that we treasure Jesus for who he is. So many times we think hanging out with friends is the same thing as being in a Jesus community, and it is not. They might look the same. It might sound the same in some aspects, but the goal in the end is totally different. Psalms 34 says, once you've tasted, right, and seen, you never want to go back. Once you've been a part of a connect group in a, in a community like, like Vive, that God is building in Vive, you don't want to go back to anything that's dry. You don't want to go back to surface relationships anymore. We don't have time for that. Life is too busy. We got too much going on. We want to get in circles and places that we can get real and vulnerable, right? Because we're all going to have bad days. Most people don't know there's a resting period when you cook a brisket. If you cook for 12, 14 hours, you got to rest it for a long time. You cut that brisket right when you pull out of the fire, it will dry up and it will be tough to chew. Some of you are like, that's what's going on in my life, right? You can't, it might look juicy for the moment, but it'll dry out. Why? Because all that juice has to get redistributed into the meat. And so often, I'm not talking about stop serving. I'm talking about we just don't know how to have a rhythm of rest daily, a abiding daily. And so what happens is we get excited and then we burn out. We're all in and then we burn out. Sign me up. And then two months later, oh, I can't do it anymore, right? As, as opposed to year after year after year, no matter what season you're in, you're like, you're still being poured out for the glory of God. You're not drying up. You're not burning up. You're getting excited as the table is growing. You're getting excited as more and more people are being a part of the family of God. Why? Because this is not your only touch point to Jesus. You are learning to abide for yourself. You are learning to grow for yourself. That way when you show up, you're ready to pour your life out. Like, ring out my life for the glory of God, amen? Like, I want us as a church, when the door closes, not physically, but when the door of our life closes, I want us to stand before God and say, I didn't hold anything back. I didn't hold my praise back. I didn't hold my worship back. I didn't hold the gifts that you've given me back. The gospel is fleshed out through his church. Those who believe and receive the gospel begin to live out the gospel in a Jesus community. This woman had this expe expensive fragrance from India. It was like her most prized possession. Like she barely ever used this because it's like if you have expensive cologne or like expensive china, you only bring it out like once in a while. Like she rarely used it. And yet when she had an encounter with Jesus, it was like he was nothing. It was like she just cracked it open, poured it all out, and she's like, whatever you have, it feels like the most normal yes imaginable to give you my yes, to bring you back my tithe, to bring you back my life of worship, to speak words of life, to be there for other people like people have been there for us. Being repentant and simply saying I'm sorry is not the same thing because crying does not equal life change. 
just saying I'm sorry or crying in the presence of God does not equal life change. So many people cry not because they're repentant church, but because something is being taken from them now. Because now they have to live with consequences. They're not crying because of life change or repentance. You see, repentance is even if I never get that back, even if I have to deal with my consequences because of my actions, come on, someone, you saved my life, you restored my life, and even if it's going to be a little bit harder to get back on the path that you have, you're still that good that you're calling me back to yourself. It's never over until God says it's over. So even if there's a detour and it takes you a little longer, you stay planted and you stay rooted. So often we're afraid, and I'm gonna, as the band comes up, we're afraid to say, have my all. Here's why. Because you think you're gonna be left empty. We're afraid, God, I'm laying down my sexuality. I'm laying down my drive for marriage. I'm laying down my finances. I'm laying down this, this, uh, this pattern that has been instilled in me because of my parents. I'm laying down my past. Why? Because you think you're going to be left empty. And then we go to the world and we go to other things trying to fill that. But when you realize Jesus is all you need, you're like, no matter if you say yes or no or close the door or open the door, whether I'm married or single, whether I have to just lay this down every single day, I am fully content in who you are because I say yes to you, not because of what you're going to do for me, not because of what I'm holding you to this promise. No, it's yes and amen because of Jesus. Let's not be naive as the band comes. We're going to sing this song again in a few minutes. Not everyone who's in a connect group or is around Jesus is following Jesus. That's why Jesus, connect group leaders, spiritual family, needed to start navigating this conversation. Because there's so many people that would love to derail things in different directions, and you need a spiritual family that say, let's bring it back to the main thing. That Jesus and his preciousness is more than enough, but let me say, it's not the only thing you need. He didn't say, I'm saving you for myself, so you'll be content by yourself. He said, I'm saving you for myself, Go plant in a a community and learn to do life together. Learn to grow with one another. This woman had all the money she could buy, but she didn't have a Jesus community. And nobody can understand the loneliness like Jesus could. There's not one human on the planet, you and me included, that could put our arm around Jesus and say, I know what you were walking through. Do you realize that? He experienced loneliness that none of us would ever experience. Isaiah 53 says this. He he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was born without sin. He was born into sin because of us. He was the perfect toddler that siblings would resent. He was the perfect teen who wouldn't always fit into society. He was rejected by his family and called crazy. Not one person can look Jesus in the eyes and say, you know what, I'm, I know what you're walking through. Hang in there. Not one person. He was rejected by his closest inner circle. He was stripped naked and beaten in a public square to shame him. Jesus doesn't just understand your loneliness, church. He came to destroy it so you can find peace in him. How? By planting you in the family of God and us learning how to grow up in our spiritual maturity. It's never just about you. It's never just about what you have going on. There is no gospel that says just me, but nobody else. That gospel is not in the word of God. There is no gospel that said it's just me and Jesus and nobody else. And so how we view community, we view community that we always go back to the word of God. Those are our anchors. If he said yes, we say yes. If he said no, we say no. We know we love the blessings of God, don't we? But so often it's the do not commands that we struggle with. But you can't embrace God for his love, but not the wrath side of God as well. That's not the way it works. You can't embrace him for like, oh, I love the blessings, but not the judgment side as well. That's not the way it works. We're doing our best in an imperfect community to say we value community so much. That's why if you're in this place and you're feeling lonely, a song might not do it. You might need to get into therapy. You need to get into a connect group with people in different places of life and don't size them up based on, oh, they have this type of tattoo or they look like they have those types of piercings or they they have gray hair or no hair or dark hair or long hair. They're tall. Don't size people up like that. 
Because I could give you story after story of people that never would have thought they would have found community in certain families. And they walked in nervous, and they walked in the first week, and, oh, man, this is never going to work. And they left, and they're like, I can't imagine my life without them. Allow yourself room to be inconvenienced in this next season. If five is going to be your home, don't just show up on Sundays. Get rooted. Get planted. Because together, we're not saying a half-hearted yes, a half-hearted you have my all. We are doing our best every single day to lay it down, just breaking everything before his feet and saying, you can have my all. Amen. Would you stand with me? There's many in the people in this place that are experiencing loneliness. And for the last few minutes that we have, we're just going to ask, just your, just your station can wait. Your, your kids can wait. But let's just take these few minutes because I know there's a lot of people experiencing loneliness in a place like this. And if you never experienced really following the real Jesus like I'm talking about today, could you be your day? We're not going to ask you to repeat a prayer or raise your hand. That's not in the scripture. But it does require you to admit that you need a savior that it was your shame, your guilt, your pain, your rebellion that put him on that cross and your need for a savior and say, from this day forward, you have my all. Is it gonna happen overnight? No. That's where discipleship and being a part of a spiritual family happens. But we have resources for you outside in our connect group table. There's a connect corner that you'll see. There's people that are praying that are open to pray with you up here at the front and up there in the balcony. Don't just leave. We'll be here. It's okay. Your kids can wait. It's going to be okay. Don't rush this moment if you're feeling lonely. If you don't know the next steps, we want to get resources in your hand. But in the next few moments, we're going to, we're going to pray and we're going to sing. And if you, need, if you need to rededicate your life to really following the real Jesus, perhaps you've never really followed him before, today's your day to say, God, I've been fighting this. I've been, I've been holding on, thinking I'm, being, I, thinking I'm going to be left empty if I don't get married. I, mean, I thought... I, if I, I'm going to be left empty if I, if I give this over. I, I feel like that person's never going to then get what they deserved if I surrender this. Like, today's your day to say, God, you have my all. Amen? God, we're just going to take these few moments before we go out there and continue church outside. We take these few moments and sing these words, and I pray we're not singing lies, but even if we can just muster up a whisper, we're going to try to unclench our fists in some areas of our life and say, they're not mine to hold anymore. This isn't mine to hold anymore. I've been so scared of the decision they are gonna make. I've been so scared of the outcome of this situation. I've been so scared because I feel like it's gonna leave me in whatever the situation is, is God, you could have my all. You love us and you love them more than we can love people. And so we surrender every fear, anxiety, shame, guilt. We surrender that to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Come on, we're just going to sing the beginning of this song again. We give. 